Spoke the world into existence Put each star in their place Every season has place because of you My life is in your hands now Everything that I am With every breath you hold You take all Dead high, this life will declare that you are God.
Come on, C3, let's put our hands together. We're gonna shout up from the rooftops tonight. Yeah. Sing it out. My failures, you came and took them away. Everything that I was is buried in the ground. chance that you have given to me. Everything that I am is in your hands. It's in your hands. Greater love has none than this. You gave your life. It's you who made us. We are yours. Come on, lift it up. Shout it from the rooftops. shattered from the rooftops because many of us in this room no matter what we've been going through in life no matter where we once were we have been comforted by Christ but he gets us comforted so that we can get uncomfortable for him in other people's lives that's what this whole conference has been about it's been about others it's been about reaching others. Tonight we shout it from the rooftops. Nothing makes God happier than to hear your praise. But what, how happy does it make God when we share his love with others? And that's what we're here for. So tonight, in this moment right now, we're gonna sing a song we've sung a lot this week. It's called Just One Touch. And as we sing it, I want you to think about people in your life that are maybe just one touch away from knowing God's love. Pray for them, sing for them, believe that God has you in their life for a purpose. Let's think about that tonight. If tonight you don't know God's love, no, you're just one touch away to.
and lift that up with us tonight. Show me your glory. Show us who you are, Jesus. Show Atbasov is one of the great leaders in our world today. Several years ago, Lisa and I had an opportunity to go to his incredible church in South Africa, Christian Revival Church. It's absolutely unbelievable. It's ridiculous what's happening right there in Africa. I know you'll love him. He has a heart for people to come to know Christ. Let's give a crazy round of applause for Pastor Atbasov. Ah, take it away. Come on, if you love Jesus, give him a shout of praise tonight in the place. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, C3. This is the final night we're going to have a Holy Ghost time in the place. There ain't no party like the Holy Ghost party because the Holy Ghost party don't stop. Amen. Amen. Let us give a big honor. You know what a great, let's just keep standing for a moment, please. What a great honor to be here tonight. And uh, to have wonderful friends that have changed not only America and many people in America, but back in South Africa, taught us a different aspect of God, creativity. We love you to bits. We salute you as true generals of God, Pastor Ed and Lisa. Come on, let's give God thanks for them. This is the real deal right here at Fellowship Church. You may take your seat. Thank you very much. What many of you don't know, once a year, I take some of my pastors and we go visit churches, but we go unannounced. And several years ago, we came to Fellowship Church and just on a normal Sunday, because at a conference, things always seem different, but we came on a normal Sunday. And let me tell you, this church is better on Sunday than it is during the conference. And we give honor to the pastors here tonight. Come on, and all the volunteer workers and all the musicians and everybody involved in C3 Church. What a great, great church this is. And thank you so much for blessing our daughters who came here for a couple of weeks, three weeks. Angelique and Chanel, uh, Laurie and Landra, thank you for spoiling my kids in such an incredible way. They just love it here and they want to come back to America. If you have your Bibles with you tonight, turn with me real quick to Romans chapter 8. Blessed are the short-winded, for they may be invited back. Well, be like Elizabeth Taylor who said to one of her husbands, I'll only keep you a little while. I feel like a racing horse tonight. 
with a slow, fast, a slow ball. I'm going to do my bit, run my race, and then he's going to come and wrap this up tonight. First, a little story. There was a little boy visiting his grandparents on their farm, and he was given a slingshot to play out in the woods. He practiced in the woods, but could never quite hit the target, almost like Steve Kelly when he came hunting in South Africa the first time. Sorry, Steve, I had to say it. I'm not in your church and your Navy SEALs on there, so they're not going to hear this. And we're not on God TV, and we're not uh, where anybody can hear what we say. Just a joke. What a great couple Pastor Steve is and his beautiful wife, Sharon. And as he was walking back, he saw Grandma's pet duck. Just out of impulse, he let it fly, hit the duck square in the head, and killed it. He was shocked and grieved, and in panic, he hit the dead duck in the wood pile, only to see his sister watching. Sally had seen it all, but she said nothing. After lunch that day, Grandma said, Sally, let's wash the dishes. But Sally said, Grandma, Johnny told me he wanted to help in the kitchen today, didn't you, Johnny? And then she whispered over to her brother, remember the duck. So Johnny did the dishes. Later, Grandpa asked the children if they wanted to go fishing, and Grandpa Ma said, I'm sorry, but I need Sally to help make supper. But Sally smiled and said, well, that's all right, because Johnny told me he wanted to do the dishes. Again, looked at Johnny and said, remember the duck. So Sally went fishing and Johnny stayed. After several days of Johnny doing both his chores and Sally, he finally couldn't stand it any longer. He came to Grandma and he confessed that he had killed the duck. I know, you see, she said, I was standing at the window and I saw the whole thing. But because I love you, I forgave you, but I was just wondering how long you would let Sally make a slave of you. I don't know what your past is tonight, my dear friend, but I do know that the enemy will keep you in your past, to keep you from the present and the future that God has for you. And I'm here to tell somebody tonight that you have a greater future than your past, that the best is yet to come. So tonight I want to talk for a couple of moments, very briefly, three things we have to know. Every preacher, every Christian alive on planet Earth, three things. If you're going to build a life, you have to realize that and know that the enemy will come against you. He will try and stop your God plan. He will try and keep you from the destiny that God has for you. As a matter of fact, opposition is part of life. The Apostle Paul said, think it not strange or weird concerning the fiery trial which is about to test you. Sometimes people go through things in life and they wonder, but where is God in all of this? When tragedy comes, when turmoil comes, it's very much part of the journey, my dear friend. But God promises you the victory all the time. In Romans chapter 8, the Bible says from verse 28, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He predestined, these He also called. Whom He called, these He justified. And whom He justified, these He also glorified. Verse number 31. What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Hallelujah. Then verse 35, the Bible says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as the sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Three things every child of God should know. Number one, the Bible says all things work together for good to them that love God. I want you to know tonight that the good, the bad, and the ugly work together for good. If you love God and you are called according to His purpose, I want you to know tonight that whatever is meant for evil, God will turn around for your good. Whatever was meant to harm you, God will turn around to bless you. God will turn every negative into a positive, every tragedy into a triumph, every mistake into a miracle. Our God is a miracle working God. There is nothing that can come against you that can push you out of the love that God has for you. Nothing you can do that will make God stop loving you. Sometimes when you go through life, 
It's easy to doubt God's love. It's easy to wonder, but God, what is happening? One of my dear friends, his name Andre Fenter, known as the Iron Man in South African sport. For many years, he was one of the top rugby players. Then one morning he phones me, says to me, Pastor, I was showering this morning, and as I was showering, my leg became lame. I said to him, Andre, don't worry about it. Everything is going to be okay. A few weeks later on, he phoned me again after having been to the doctor. He said, played over 70 tests for South Africa against countries like Australia, New Zealand. And he said to me, I'm in a hospital. I said, Andre, what's wrong? He said, I've lost the feeling in my leg. I'm lying in a hospital and the doctor says, they have no hope for me. Well, I rushed over to the hospital and there Andre was. To cut a long story short, his life changed that day. One of the fittest men in sport ever in South Africa. That day, tragedy came. That day, bad things happened in his life, which left him paralyzed in a wheelchair today. And I had to go to him as his pastor with a message, all things work together for good. To them that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. If you love and serve the purpose of God for your life, it doesn't matter what life throws at you. It doesn't matter what the enemy does. You're going to come out on top on the other side. You're going to be better for it. Even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil because God is on your side. Oh, come and if you believe it tonight, give him a shout and a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. He's taken this negative and turned it into a positive, as we can in our lives. I've seen him raise money for other kids that have broken their necks in rugby. I've seen him use this absolute negativity as a springboard, like Helen Keller, who said, I thank God for my handicaps. I thank God for the negatives in my life, because although it's meant for evil, God can use it for the good in the life of somebody else. You see, my dear friend, if we live a life of purpose, then tragedy is not final. What is meant to harm us will not have the final say. God will always have the final say. We will not crawl in a hole somewhere and give up and quit on our dreams and on what God has planned for us. We will keep on keeping on. Another young man in our church, a national gymnast, one holiday as he was away with his friends, he dove into the sea and broke his neck, was phoned again, paralyzed from his neck down and the doctor said there's no hope for him. He'll never walk again. But I went to Jared and I said to him, Jared, you can have faith in God. You can still live this great life that God has for you. And you know, Jared began to trust God. Jared, in the midst of a crisis and in the midst of adversity, he began to work out in the gym. And today, Jared can move his arms. Jared, every Saturday I will see him in the gym and he will be the guy with the biggest smile in the gym. And sometimes I feel like a dog when I go to gym on a Saturday morning. Past Ed, I will tell you, because I just stumble in there and I'm all tired and I'm all weary. And yes, it's Jared in his wheelchair. And he will always look at me with those big eyes of his in a wheelchair. And he will say to me, how are you, Pastor? And I say, Jared, how are you? He says, Pastor, I'm blessed. I'm doing great. Because Jared decided I will not let the negativities of life define me. What was meant for evil, God will turn around for my good. Although I cannot control what is happening in my life, I can't control how I will respond to situations. You see, dear pastor, sometimes betrayal will come. Sometimes people will plot against you and people will scheme against you. Sometimes things come and life will throw you a curveball. And my kids will say to me since they were this high, but daddy, that's not fair. And I will always tell them, but life is not fair. God is fair, but life is not fair. Things happen that shouldn't happen. Solomon says it's all vanity. We can come and have all our doctrines figured out, but as a pastor, if you pastor long enough and you pastor many people, things happen you don't have any explanation for. And the only thing that makes sense is to know that God loves people and that God has a plan and God has a purpose for people. To tell that person, the only reason you have to get up is because you have a purpose. You have to live your life with purpose, on purpose, every day. You can go and do good when you feel bad. You can go and help other people when you feel low. You can go and pray for the sick even when you are sick. You can encourage people when you feel you have no life on the inside of you. Because you can know 
all things work together for good to them who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. All things work together for good. The good, the bad, the ugly, the planned and the unplanned, the highlights and the lowlights, all things work together for good. I'm going to be better because of this. I'm coming out on the other side. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For God, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life in Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe it, give him a shout of praise. Hallelujah. So the first thing to remind yourself of, I have to as a pastor, all things work together for good. When I don't understand what is happening, when I don't understand why people do what they do, when things go wrong, and they do sometimes, I stay anchored in the love of God and in the purpose of God that I'm going to get up again whether I feel like it or not. I'm going to preach another sermon. I'm going to help somebody else. I'm going to do good when I feel bad. I'm going to help people when I feel low because I know there's light on the other side of the tunnel. Weeping endures for a moment, but joy comes in the morning. Winter is followed by summer. The best is yet to come. God is a God of a turnaround. Oh, come on, C3 Conference. Shout a big amen in the place. Hallelujah. All things, all things work together for good. So we're going to have the final say, because God has already decided all things. No matter how hard you knock me, I'm going to get back up again. I'm going to have the final say. All things work together for good to them that love God. Number two, God is for you. I remind myself every day God is for me. God is my biggest fan. God cheers me on. God believes in me. The Bible says in Romans 8, if God is for you, who can be against you? You know, sometimes we focus on all the negative negativities in life. We focus on what people say. But what does God say? God says, I'm for you. God says, I'm behind you. God says, I have saved you. God says, I've washed you in my blood. God says, I'm in the heavens. I'm in that grandstand. I'm cheering you on to run and run and run and run. Because God is for you. You are more than a conqueror. That means you live with the unfair advantage. That means when you go for the job interview, you are the winner before you walk in there. The greater one lives on the inside of you. You have what it takes. You were created in the image of God. That's what the Bible says. You hail from God. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So don't go through life with your shoulders stooped. Lift your head up. Put your shoulders back. Look your head world in the eye. And know that God is for you. God is cheering you on. God is behind you. God is for you. God says you can do it. God knows what you can do. God designed you. God says you can build that church. You just need to keep on keeping on because you're more than a conqueror. When the enemy knocks you down, get back up again. It's not how you fall. It's how you get up. Amen. The most natural thing to do when you fall over is to get back up again. And if there's nobody to pick you up, then pick yourself up. Sometimes I drag myself out of the bed. I drag myself to the gym. People wait for a feeling. We don't need a feeling. We have God who says, I'm for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? It doesn't matter who comes against you. It doesn't matter how they plot or how they scheme. It matters what God is saying. It matters the one that stands behind you, the one who will shut the mouth of the lion, the one who will vindicate you, the one who says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper, the one who says, every tongue risen against you in judgment, you will condemn. So tonight, God is for you, not against you. So live your life with confidence. Live knowing that you will succeed, you will not fail. Live knowing tonight that you will overcome. Live knowing tonight that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. God is for you. More are those that are for you than those that be against you. Hallelujah. When you build that building, when you go for that job interview, when you raise those children, whatever you do, God is for you. Think about a boxer for a moment. The one who conquers in the ring, the heavyweight champion going against Mike Tyson. Better protect your ear. <laughs> there he's standing against this big giant and he's boxing and boxing and gets battered, bruised, falls two rounds, but he gets back up again. Just like the Apostle Paul says. He says, we may be battered and bruised. The English word says perplexed, troubled and bewildered at what is happening, but we're not hopeless. We may not know what to do, but we know God knows what to do. We may not know what the outcome of the situation is, but we know God knows the outcome of the situation. We just keep on keeping on. 
We get out of that ring, like Rocky two, Rocky three, Rocky four, Rocky five, Rocky seven, Rocky 10. Why do we watch Rocky? Because Rocky gets up every time, amen. Everybody loves a winner. Rocky gets up back again, not waiting for a feeling. 60 years old and Rocky stumbles out again and there he stands. <laughs> and we all know Rocky is gonna come with this one swing. And that's all it takes, my dear friend, one swing. All it takes is one more time. All it takes is for you to get up one more time, to believe God one more time, to pray one more time, to give one more time, to go one more time. Come on, if God is for you, who can be against you? God is on your side. It doesn't matter what people say. So that boxer is the conqueror. When he comes home and his beautiful wife takes the check, she's more than a conqueror. She's the one who spends the money. And every brother in the house said, come on, every brother in the house, you know you work your heart out. And your wife comes, she takes the check, and she does the spending. Where are you going? I'm shopping. What are you doing? I'm resting so I can preach. More than a conqueror. Well, Jesus conquered for you, my dear friend. Jesus conquered death. Jesus conquered the grave. Jesus conquered sin. Jesus conquered disease. Jesus conquered negativity. Jesus conquered every adversity in this world. So you can live your life as more than a conqueror. Come on, somebody shout tonight. I'm more than a conqueror in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, say it, 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 say it tonight. Come on, somebody, say I'm more than a conqueror. It feels good. I'm more than a conqueror. Come on. I'm more than a conqueror. Great God. More than a conqueror. Well, it's how, it's how, it's how many people live their lives. It's how they live their lives. Battered, bruised. I'm not going to believe God again. Tried my best. I've heard this before. I'm just going to survive. I'm just going to be that white knuckle Christian hanging in there until Jesus comes back. It's not what God says. He says you're more than a conqueror. Jesus didn't come to make you domesticated and civilized. He didn't come to give you this little mediocre life. He said, follow me and I will make you somebody. Follow me and I will turn you into this racing horse and set you free to run for big dreams and great goals, to live this life of adventure more than a conqueror. We should be like horses every day, chomping at the bit, ready to go, running for God in our generation. So number one, all things work together for good. Joseph, when he was in prison, he never planned that. He had a great dream, great vision. Never thought these things would happen, but they did. When his brother stood and bowed before him in Genesis chapter 50, Joseph says, what was meant for evil, God has turned around for my good. He says an amazing thing. In the place of adversity, he says, I'm in the place of God. I'm exactly where God wants me to be because of the purpose of God. All things work together for good to them who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. What was meant for evil, God has turned around for my good because of the purpose of God. I just have to hold my ground. I just have to stay faithful. I just have to keep on keeping on. I just have to believe in the faithfulness of God and not give up on the dream and the vision that God has given me because all things work together. I said all things work together. Those things you don't understand, all things work together for good to them that love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. God is for you. Who can be against you? Oh, when people come, God's standing behind you. God is for you. I say God is for you. You don't need man's vote. You have God's vote. I've never built a building with man's vote. As a matter of fact, the first building we ever built, the people said, we're not going to be able to do it. But if God says it, that settles it. What do you believe? Come on, pastor, what do you believe? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can and I will because God is for me. Number three. Nothing can separate you from the love that God has for you. That's a big one. We heard this last night. God smiles upon us. God watches over us. So many people live in doubt, doubting the love of God. So many people are not secure in the love that God has for them. 
So many people are waiting for affirmation as we heard last night. God affirmed you on he in heaven. God affirmed you through his son 2,000 years ago. There's nothing you can do that will make God stop loving you. God loves you. God cares about you. There's nothing that can separate you from the love that God has for you. Nothing you can do that will make God stop loving you. The Bible says we know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. Watching on God TV, wherever you may be sitting today, God loves you in that lounge today. God cares about you. He doesn't matter what you have done, where you have been. I want to tell you tonight that God loves you. God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for you because you are valuable and you are precious to Jesus tonight. He doesn't matter where you've been. You may be the lowest person and feel at the lowest place of your life. God will not turn His back on you. God will come right where you are. There's hope for you tonight because my Bible says nothing can separate you from the love of God. There is no one who can separate you from the love of God. Oh, the church will judge you. People will put you down, but God will not. God says, I love you in spite of you. I'll never forget one night when I put my children in bed, beautiful three blondies. And as I walked out of the room and I, they were small. And as I walked out of the room, I just prayed one of those prayers. I said, God, if you just love me half this much, overwhelmed with love and emotion for them. And I heard the Holy Spirit say, you have no idea. I want to tell you tonight, you have no idea how much God loves you. And if you doubt the love that God has for you, you will never be able to believe all things work together for good. When things go tough in your life, you will doubt and wonder, where are you, God? You will wonder, why am I going through this? You will, you will become, begin to waver in your faith. The Bible says faith works by love. Understanding the love that God has for you. Understanding that God loves you and that God will carry you through. Understanding that God is in control even when it feels as if God is not in control. I've been in those places having to believe. Feel nothing. God where you are, but God carrying you every step of the way. He loves you, my dear friend. He cares about you, my dear friend. He loves you, pastor. There's nothing that you can do that can separate you from the love that God has for you. David says, where will I go from your presence? If I ascend into the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, your hand shall lead me and guide me there. The darkness and the light are both alike unto you. What is he saying? That sin can no longer separate me from the love of God. A lot of preachers that tell people, God... Well, sin will keep you away from God. Let me tell you something. God sent the remedy through Jesus Christ. And he demonstrated the love that God has for humanity. And he dealt with sin 2,000 years ago once and for all. He canceled the handwriting of the ordinances. And he said, your sin and your iniquity I will no longer remember. A new dispensation. The law versus grace and truth. What the law could not do, God did by sending His Son, Jesus, and condemned sin in the flesh. Through Christ today, you're a new creature. Through Christ today, you are forgiven. Through Christ today, you are whole. Through Christ today, you are accepted. Through Christ today, you're a child of God. Oh, come on, give a better hand clap than that tonight. Come on. Hallelujah. God loves you. God cares about you. When that woman was caught in adultery and everybody was standing and judging her and accusing her, what did Jesus do? The Bible says he stooped down. He got to a level. And what did he show her? Love and mercy. God became a man. God put on humanity and showed us how to love people. We live in a world back in South Africa when people make mistakes, people are quick to point fingers. And Jesus himself went and then he stood and faced the accusers. He said, he that is without sin cast the first stone. Those of you that are perfect. But he knew there was none. And then he went back to this woman and he loved her, the Bible says, because there's no greater power than the power of love. Because when, once love enters your life, you feel accepted, you feel approved. Once you connect with the love of God, you feel clean, you feel washed. That's what Jesus came to do. He came to cleanse you. He came to wash you. He came to love you when you least deserved it. So I want you to know tonight that God loves you. Never doubt the love that God has for you. Never doubt that all things will turn out okay. Never doubt in your life that if God is for you, it doesn't matter who is against you. Tonight in this place, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you are going through. But I want to tell you something. That if you were the only person alive in planet Earth, 
Jesus would have died for you. So much does God love you. So much does God value you. So much does God value the people in our congregations. When we stand up and we preach, God is off to the one person in our midst. The one prodigal. The one that have gone astray. The one that have run away from God. Can we have the Pentecostal moment? The keyboard player, please. God is off to people. When we doubt the love of God, the Bible says, our hearts condemn us. We live with this cloud over our lives. But when we understand the love of God, the Bible says, we assure our hearts in the presence of God. We put to rest our hearts that God loves us. There's no judgment. He that feareth has not been made perfect in love. Judgment has been passed 2,000 years ago. When you accept Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you are. I don't know what you've been through. But I know what Jesus went through for you. I know his story. I know the price he paid for you. And maybe you're sitting here tonight in the shadow somewhere. And you've grown cold in your heart towards God. You love God, but you're not in love with him. Your heart has wandered away from him. And tonight in this place, God is talking to you. Right there where you sit, I'm going to pray for you. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. I just want every head bowed for a moment in this place. And I'm going to say one little prayer. God so loved that He gave. Watching on television tonight, God so loved that He gave. He loves you sitting over there. He knows everything about you and He chooses to love you. Reaching out to you tonight. You say, that's me tonight. If I came all the way from America or from Africa just for you. That's how important you are. You say, yes, that's me. I've wandered away. I've become disillusioned. I've grown cold. I've lost my urgency and my fire for God. I've been like that prodigal son. I've wandered away from my father's house. But tonight, I want to come back. I want to give Jesus his rightful place. God loves you. God loves you. If Jesus was here in the flesh tonight, he would go to the person who felt the lowest. And he would go put his arms around you and lift you to the place that he called you to be. So tonight in this place, you say, that's me. I need to get right with God. Quietly, wherever you are, just raise your hand quickly. Just right there where you are. Just slip your hand up high. Thank you, God. Bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. Just slip your hand up. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Quickly, slip it up tonight. There where you are. There where you are. Don't run from him, run to him. There's a heaven to gain, there's a hell to shun. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. God brought you to this place tonight to get this one thing in your heart that He loves you. That there is no place you can go where the love of God will not find you. There is nothing you can do that will make God stop loving you. Tonight you need to reconnect with that love again. One more time, many of you raised your hands. If you've not yet raised your hands, slip your hand up quickly. There's a stirring in your heart. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Bless you, bless you, bless you all over this place. God bless you, bless you, bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you up there. God bless you there, 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 there. There. He's the only one who can change you. He's the only one who can make you whole. If you raised your hand, we're not going to ask you to do anything else, but just stand with me right where you are for a moment. Everybody else, out of respect, just keep the atmosphere of worship, please. Just stand with me. You're not going to come to the front. Just stand with me right where you are, all over this auditorium. Just stand, 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 right there. You've raised your hand. Just stand to your feet quickly. I'm just going to say a prayer with you right now. Come on. Come on. Come on. There's a stirring in your heart. God is knocking at your heart tonight. Nothing in the world will do it. God is bringing you back to himself tonight. Come home. Come home. Come home. Come home. Come home tonight. Come on, young person. Come home. Come home tonight. Come home. All things work together for good. God is for you. God is not against you. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Tonight in this place, there's more of you. There's a stirring in your heart. You say, yes, I'm reaching back to God. God's reaching down to you. It's your moment to reach back to God. Stand to your feet and say, yes, Lord. 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 Come on. You feel he's stirring in your heart. Don't shut the door. For by grace we are saved through faith. When God knocks, say your yes, 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 yes. Say your yes. Say your yes. Just say this prayer, everybody with me tonight. Say, I surrender all. 
to you, Jesus. I believe with all my heart you died for my sin. I believe you rose from the grave. I believe you're alive. I give you my life. Take your place right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may take your seat. Thank you. Let's give them a big, big, big. Come on, big God bless you all those people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's rejoice with the angels in the heavens tonight. Come on, pastors. We want to see people saved on Sundays in our churches. We want to talk about the love of God and we want to see full altars. We want to see full altars. We want to empty hell and full heaven. We want to plunder hell and we want to populate heaven. Come on. Come on, church. Come on. This is our time. This is our time. This is our time to make a difference for our God in our generation. Come on, just keep on praising Him for a moment. Somebody in this place, God's going to give you a new boldness as a pastor to stir up the anointing in your heart to reach people for Jesus Christ. Come on, come on. Stovall Weems. Weems, I love your voice. You, you remind me of the ultimate coach. And you know what? A pastor is a leader. A pastor is a teacher. A pastor is a coach. And Weems is a coach. Pastor, 
Stovall and Pastor Kerry Weems, people that I just bonded with, connected with when I met them. I've been to their fantastic church many times. It is amazing what's happening in Jacksonville, Florida. Don't hold this against him. He's an LSU Tiger. We still love him. But the dude loves to fish. He likes to hunt. There's no one like Weems. I just like to call him Weems. Weems, Weems had this major heart surgery. Weems is like a Timex watch. Takes a lick and it keeps on ticking. Yeah, 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 sir. And we nicknamed him the defibrillator because you can't take him down with some major heart surgery. So I want everybody to start saying Weems. That's right. Say Weems with me. One, two, three. Weems. No cheering, no clapping. Weems. That's right. Weems. 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 Come on. Weems. Everybody, Weems. Stand to your feet, Weems. Weems. Weems, Weems, Weems. Here he is, pastor of Celebration Church, author of The Awakening. He has got more energy than anybody you've ever seen in your life. He's a caffeinated preacher and teacher. Let's go crazy for Stovo. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you, Wood. Uh... Would you just please remain standing for just a moment? Uh, how about, let's give it up for the fellowship staff and team, all the volunteers, all the volunteers. And uh, of course, Pastor Ed and Lisa are such fantastic leaders. They attract great leaders. And, and Pace and the entire staff here at Fellowship, you guys are just amazing. All of the volunteers, Ed and Lisa, thanks once again for putting on a top-notch first-class conference. Come on, give it up for your pastors, Ed and Lisa Young. Yes. You guys can, can be seated. You know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, he said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You know, it's interesting that language that he used, Jesus, he didn't say, I will build a church or I will build the church. He said, I will build my church. That language there, it's very possessive, my church. And Ed and Lisa, I want to thank you for building what is most precious to Jesus, all the time, the energy, and the money that you put into C3 Conference and everything else. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Come on, give it up for him one more time, huh? You know, uh, it's, an, it's an honor to speak at the final session of, of, of C3, and, and I think God is up to something big. And I think God is up to something even bigger than we think, even bigger than, than we know. And uh, that's what I want to speak to tonight. You know, it's interesting. We, we just came out of our 21 days of sex. I mean, 21 days of prayer and fasting. I'm all confused when I get to fellowship church. 21 days of... We did the 21 days of fasting, now we're in 21 days of sex. And uh, when I, I, I was fasting, and it's interesting, God spoke to me this word that I'm going to share tonight. He spoke to me this word for C3 conference, the message I'm going to speak tonight. I've, I've, I've preached the same passage of Scripture before, but I've never preached this message. And he spoke it as I was in a season of prayer and fasting for this conference, and it was really interesting because when we got the times, the speaking times, I was kind of like, wow, God, this, this word, it does, I, don't, I mean, I'm going to preach it because I, I feel like it's what you gave to me, God, but I don't know if it's going to go as well in this time. And then, lo and behold, we got a call a couple of days later, and they said, okay, we want you to speak on Friday night now. And I was like, wow, God, that is the perfect spot for this message. And Ed, I don't know if you remember this, but... Um, a couple of years ago, we were just talking, and um, I, I had a real word for Ed. And I, I, don't, I don't do that a lot. I don't get those a lot. And, and in fact, Ed, you were the only pastor that I've ever said anything like this to. And uh, I just had this word for Ed, and I said, Ed, because I've always admired Ed and Fellowship Church. And by the way, I'm just encouraging you, all you pastors and leaders, I mean, you better sign up for 2013 right now. I mean, the rates that they have right now. Listen, every year Celebration Church is 13 years old. We're over 10,000 people. If I have not been here because of traveling or some schedule conflict, part of my staff has been here for the last 13 years. 
at, at C3 conference. It, it is unbelievable. And, and, and I, I had this word and I called Ed. I said, Ed, you know, as great as fellowship's been and all the great things that you've done for the body of Christ, I just, I don't know what you're going through, but I just feel like I need to tell this to you that, that in the future years, the things that God's gonna do in and through fellowship are gonna be so much greater even than the things that he's done in the past. And, and yeah, give God a hand for that. Come on, give, give God a clap if you feel that, man. And, and, and I believe that you guys are stepping into that, and I believe that there's a season in the body of Christ right now where God is doing something and preparing us, pastors and church leaders, for something even bigger than we think. So I'm just going to ask you for this last session, come on, I want you to put all your heart, I want you to put all your energy, I want you to give God ears to hear because I think he's going to speak something profound to you. How many of you know, look, at your level of expectation, what you perceive is what you're going to receive. So you put value to this right now, and I believe God's going to download something. I believe that what I'm going to speak to you, there's a thread that's been running through the conference. I, when, when you speak at a conference, I don't believe in just coming and bringing your own deal. You've got to kind of pipe in yes. to the big picture of what God is doing here. You know, it's so interesting. Um, the other day, I was, or, or a few weeks ago, I was watching the State of the Union Address. How many of y'all have seen the State of the Union Address? And I've never even noticed this. I've watched the State of the Union Address before, but I never noticed this. And, you know, we don't know how to divide a Congress is and all that kind of stuff. But, but every now and then, President Obama would say something that everybody kind of agreed with, and everyone would stand. You've seen this? They all stand to a roaring <laughs> ovation. And I thought to myself, here's a man just speaking man's words, and here's all these people, Presbyterians, Methodists, I bet you some of those people have never showed that much honor and appreciation ever in the house of God when we're not speaking the words of man, but we're speaking the words of our everlasting God. So yeah, yeah, no, 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 wait, 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 almost, almost, get ready. Oh, get ready, you know where it's going right now. This is, has so much more eternal impact than any State of the Union address. God's Word has so much more impact than any word of man. So I'm just going to give you a scripture real quick, one that we've all heard many times before, but I want us to honor it like it means something. Are you ready, John 3, 16? For God so loved the world. What? What? You better stand up and honor God for that. What? 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 Are you kidding me? And it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there. Hold on, Congress of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't end there. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should have everlasting life. What? What? Are you kidding me? That will change your life. That will change a city. That change a country. That word will change the world. Let's honor God. Man. Woo. You may be seated. We're, we're going to have the state of the church address tonight. And we're going to hear from our commander in chief the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh yeah, he's here. Where two or three are gathered, there he is in the midst of them. Jesus is here. If you have your Bibles, go to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. Chapter 37. As you're going there, I want to read a scripture out of 1 Corinthians 15, 34, and then I'll read out of Ezekiel 37. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, 34, awake to righteousness and do not sin 
For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. You know, it's a shame when the church is not alive for God. And then here in Ezekiel chapter 37, I'm going to begin, begin reading in verse 1. This is a very familiar passage of Scripture. We know that this prophecy is literally fulfilled in the restoration of Israel in the end times. Ezekiel has a very unique perspective. He's one of the few biblical writers who was not only a prophet but also a priest so he could understand very well not, not only the move of God but also the structure of God and the form of the priesthood. Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 1, he says, The hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley and it was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface, remember that, on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you. Think about this vision, this scene that Ezekiel is seeing right here. I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live and I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. That is the purpose of God in the earth, isn't it? That all people would know that he is the Lord. He said, so I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied there was a sound and behold a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone and I looked and behold, there were sinews on the flesh, and the flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. So now this prophecy, this voice in the valley, it's kind of twofold. He says, then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, on, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came in, into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. How many of you know God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ever ask or think? I want to talk to you about the state of the church and just the incredible things that I think that we're on the brink of, and I've entitled this message, We Are the Church. We are the church. Father, we thank you for your word. Jesus, we thank you that you are our commander in chief, and we just stand at attention right now in honor, Lord. And God, I thank you for hungry hearts to hear your word. Speak through me tonight, Jesus. In your precious name we pray, and everybody said, amen. amen. You know, several years ago, I was on a flight back from Washington, D.C., and uh, I think the 9-11 attacks were three or four years ago from this time. It must have been around 2005. And as I got on this plane, I was flying uh, to Jacksonville uh, from D.C. And uh, we were up in the air, and, and, you know, everything seemed fine. And, and uh, the thing went off where you could use your electronics and all that kind of stuff. And, and this guy, this college kid that was sitting in front of me, just a college kid, had on, you know, a hat. He gets up and he goes to the bathroom. And he goes to the bathroom. Now, now, little did I know at this time, and I don't think many people knew this on the plane, but there was this special FAA regulation. Some of you might have known about it. I don't know if it was in all the cities, but it was definitely flying out of Washington, D.C. There's this special FAA regulation that you had to be a certain there was a mileage that you had to be from the city before you could get up at all, regardless of how high you were. Now, I don't remember the, 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 the captain or anybody announcing that rule or anything else, and obviously this guy didn't either. So he gets up, and he goes on back to the bathroom, not thinking anything of it. And all of a sudden, I look up, and not the stewardess, but, but the steward dude. <laughs> steward, steward man, stu the steward guy, flight attendant. The flight attendant sees sees this guy go into the bathroom. I saw the kid, this college kid, hard, sees the guy go in the bathroom. I kid you not, starts running, running through the aisles as, as fast as he could, screaming, sir, sir, no, runs all 
all the way to the back of the plane, starts banging on the bathroom door. Sir, come out of the bathroom. FAA regulations, FAA regulations. <laughs> People are freaking out. I'm freaking out, man. I'm like, what is this? Is this college kid? Is this like Osama's nephew? Like, what in the? I'm like, what in the world is going on? And, and the flight people are confused, and the, 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 the attendant, uh, it, you know, FAA regulations, sir. And it's not to diss or anything, but it's a little bit effeminate, you know what I'm saying? So it's kind of like, FAA regulations. <laughs> I'm just saying how he was. You come out of that room. Hey, listen. So everybody is freaked out. Everybody's freaked out. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, and the kid wasn't coming out. And then finally, I see this kid. He props open the bathroom door, terrified. He kind of looks like that. He didn't come out because he, he was doing number two. He was taking a dump in there. You know what I'm saying? He's like, all this panic, all this chaos almost diverted the flight. People confused. Flight attendants screaming. You know, sometimes I wonder. When the world looks at the church, do all they hear is a bunch of yelling about rules and regulations when they don't have any idea who Jesus was or what being a Christian is all about? And that's why the Bible says in Corinthians 15, 34, it says, look, before you can sin not, the first thing you have to do is awaken unto righteousness. For too long, the church has been real good at saying, do not sin, do not sin, do not sin, do not sin. But we haven't been real good at teaching people how to come alive to God. Oh, come on, you can clap better than that. We're called to be alive, church. The greatest witness, and Lee Strobel said it great, the greatest witness that the church has always had is the love and life of Jesus to a lost and hurting world. And here in Ezekiel chapter 37, we see the prophet, he has a vision of God's people coming alive. And it's real interesting. The first thing that Ezekiel talks about, he says he sees these dry bones in this valley. But the bones were not buried. They were on the surface of the valley. Listen, no matter what you might think is dead, if God has a purpose for it, it might look dead, but remember, it's not buried. Those bones weren't buried. Ezekiel, they were sitting up there on the surface and you might think, man, there's things in your life, things in your ministry, your marriage, whatever. It might look dead to you. I'm telling you, God has a purpose for it. It might look dead, but remember this. It's not buried. There's the purpose of God in those bones. Listen to me. Your marriage might look dead. Your ministry might look dead. You might be stuck at 200 people. It might look dead or impossible to go beyond that. I'm telling you, the purpose of God is in your marriage. The purpose of God is in your church. The purpose of God is in your kids. It doesn't matter if it looks dead. The purpose of God is in those bones. See, that's what Ezekiel didn't know. That's why when God told Ezekiel, God said, Ezekiel, can these bones live? He's like, yo, I don't know. I don't know. Ezekiel didn't realize those bones were God's bones. Those bones had God's purpose in them. And anything that God has purpose in, regardless of how it looks, it can look as dead as a doornail. It's just waiting there to come to life. Can you give God a hand for that? Listen, uh, let, me, let me do this real quick. I'm going to do this real quick right now. I need an honest moment. Y'all ready? I need an honest. We need to be transparent for a moment. Can we have an honest moment? 
Real quick, seriously, sir. How many of you came to C3 conference? And you'd say, Stovall, whether it's my relationship with God or maybe just tired, fatigued in the ministry, be honest. Look, you're, you're amongst friends and family here. How many of you say, Stovall, my own relationship or in my ministry, I just feel like there's some, there's some dry bones there. Would you just be honest and raise a hand? Look at all. I want you to stand up real quick, every single one of you that raised your hand. Look at this. Stand up. Stand up. We love you. Come on. Give my hand, everybody. Look at, look at them. Right now, you remain standing. You remain standing. Come on, Pastor, we're going to speak over them right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you that these dry bones, they look dead, but they're not buried, Lord. Your purpose is in them. That breakthrough is coming. They're going to come to life in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. Come on, give God a hand. You can be seated. Oh, did I feel something back there? Don't get me excited. Oh, this is going somewhere. Okay, y'all just hold on, man. That's like a drug for me, I'm telling you, man. When the, when the organ goes on, it's like a shock goes up my spine and my preaching goes, I'm like, and God said, and it goes on my organ, God said, ha, 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 ha. Look. Listen, the next thing, I like what God tells Ezekiel. He says, Ezekiel, you need to prophesy. You need to prophesy. Ezekiel, this is about my purpose. This is about ex an exceedingly great army. This is about coming alive. You need to prophesy. It's interesting God used the word prophesy. He didn't say, hey, Ezekiel, you know, gather everybody around. Let's have a meeting. Just, you know, bring everybody in. Make sure everybody's on board. Let's discuss some principles and precepts. And he said, no, man, prophesy. He said, bring the word of the Lord. Listen, we are the church. We are God's instrument of bringing the word of the Lord in the earth. Amen. Pastor, you don't think it's important for what, of what you're doing? You are God's vehicle to bring the word of the Lord in the earth. And Ed, I want to thank you for C3 Conference, for having a conference. Listen, you hadn't just been listening to messages while you've been at C3. You've been hearing the word of the Lord for your life, for your ministry, for your church. Ed and Lisa, thank you. Thank you for having a conference in a church where the word of the Lord can come through. I, can I just, can I, man, I'm just so tired of sissy church. I'm tired of it, man. I'm tired. Of, I'm all, tired of all the, everybody okay? And do you want to see, receive Jesus? Please receive Jesus. Look, look, turn all the lights off. No one's looking around. Could you just put up a pinky? Could you just please? What are you doing? You know what we do at Celebration Church? This is our, uh, this is my salvation call. Ready? All the lights on. Everybody look around. Ask my staff that's here tonight. All the lights on, everybody look around. You know what I've learned? Because if you can't stand for God in a church, you surely aren't going to stand for him in the world. Oh, come on! Come on! Man! We're the church! We're the church! Oh, man. Finish. Can I just say, uh, listen, this is a humble brag, but I'm making a point. Can I permission? Okay, so listen, this month from January 1st to February 4th at Celebration Church, okay, we have had 2,332 decisions for Christ where people stand up in front of everybody. Okay, watch this. Watch, watch this. We've baptized baptized 667 people, and I didn't even preach on baptism. Now, I'm saying, I'm saying that to say, listen, listen, we're the church. God is doing something. People are hungry for God. People are hungry for truth. 
And I believe that if we'll catch hold of it, and that's what all, it's awesome about C3, you can come here and you can, you can catch hold of what the move of God is going to look like. You can be seated. Oh, man. Man, we've just got to, I love what Ed says. I love how he says, the, how you say, the real and the raw. We've gotten so polished, all these boutique churches, and we're a specialty church. <laughs> Social clubs, inward, a bunch of Western, white, intellectual, navel-gazing, philosophizing, Man, what about Christ? What about people? Emergent. What's that? Like the church has finally emerged. Let, let, let me just, I'm just going to be, listen, if you're emergent, you need detergent, okay? You need, you need to clean up that Pharisee attitude. And I'll say another thing, you might be reformed, it's fine to be reformed, but you better get revived. You better show the love of God. You better show the love, I don't care what camp you're in, you better show the love and life of God. Or you know what? Or all the world will hear from you is this, FAA regulations, FAA regulations, you're breaking the rules, you're breaking the rules. so good. Hey, we're the church. We're the church. You understand this? We're, we're all God's got. There's no plan B. We're it. In this word coming through Ezekiel, this, this prophecy, it's real interesting. It's, it's twofold. First of all, you know, he, he prophesies, he says, he says, speak to the bones. He talks about he prophesies to the bones and, and, and the bodies, you know, the, 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 there's flesh, they have a covering, they have a form, but they're still not alive. And then he says, okay, the next thing you need to do is you need to call to the winds so that the breath will come. And I've noticed in the body of Christ, it's like, even though there's just one voice in the valley, it's kind of like we've made it two and we haven't understood that it's one voice and one purpose for the church. And for so long, especially when I began ministry, the, you know what the big word was? Relevant. Relevant. Be relevant. Very important to be relevant. How many of you would agree with that? And that voice about the form, about the structure. Be relevant. Be relevant. Get your walls down. Get the Christianese out of your mouth. You know what I'm saying? Become fluid. Church without walls. Coffee shops. You got you to gotta, you gotta package. We need a beautiful package because we have a beautiful message. Can I have a good amen to that? But it's like there's still so much, fo it's, like, it's like relevance, 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 form, 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 form. But you know, if we're not careful, today's relevance will become tomorrow's religion. And we'll have a form of godliness, but not have the power. It's not just about the form, although that is important. And then there's this other voice that's been in the body of Christ, kind of the voice I grew up in originally when I got saved in church, and it was all about the wind. Wind, wind, Lord, send your wind, send your wind, send your wind. Send revival, send your revival. I call the form people the relevance. I call the wind people the revivalist. And there's some that's the relevance. Be relevant, be relevant, be relevant. There's the revivalist. Send the wind, send the wind, send the wind. One's on the form, one's on the wind. 
but they're asking for the win. They got no vision. They got no strategy. They got no philosophy of ministry. They got no, they wouldn't know what to do with revival if it hit them in the face. See, the function, watch, that's why the prophecy is about both. See, the function is in the form. That's how revival can be sustainable. The wake up is in the wind. The function's in the form. The wake up is in the wind. But the breakthrough is in the breath. And when revival meets relevance, the church will come into a revolutionary breakthrough like we've never seen before. And I'm telling you that that's where I believe the church is headed in this next year and, then we've, and that we've already begun. Listen, we're not only going to be a church of, of form, have all the strategy, have all the structures and all that, but, and we're also going to be a church of wind. Man, we're going to rely on the Holy Spirit. We're going to be spirit-led yet strategic. Relevance is going to meet revival, and we're going to have a revolutionary move of God like we've never seen. How many of you are with me on this? How many of you are with me on this? See, the breakthrough's in the breath. You have to have the form and the wind so you can have the breath, and that's where the life is, and that's when the church goes from being a congregation to being a family to now being an exceedingly great army. And here's, here's what I believe we've experienced up to this point, and God's been building all throughout these last few decades. We've experienced the church as a congregation. We've experienced the church as a family. Man, we've gotten relevant, but we understand we have to have revival and be strategic-led. I believe the next move of the church is the strategic yet spirit-led churches that become this exceedingly great army in the earth. Come on, will you receive that? Will you receive that? Now what? Sit down one more time. Sit down one more time. Remember this. You know, we talk about, oh, God can do exceedingly abundantly above and all this kind of stuff. Do you know that the exceeding and the great is in the army? See, it's all about purpose. These bones are all about purpose. You're all about purpose. Listen, we are the church. We are the church. We're all God's got. There's no plan B. Look around, man. This is it. We're the church. I'll never forget when I was about 12 years old. I was about 12 years old, and even though I had the form, I had the size, I I wasn't a very good athlete yet. (laughs) Yet, I ended up being a very good athlete. I mean, look at this impressive physical physique at the (laughs) young age of 42. I mean, this is a masterpiece of... (laughs) When I was 12 years old, I'll never forget, I was at a baseball game. And um, I was just, I was one of those kids that even though I was a big kid, I was kind of afraid to swing the bat. And um, lo and behold, our team, it was a real important game. We were down by a couple of runs. It was the last inning in the game. The bases were loaded and I was up to bat. And I'll never forget coming out of that dugout, man, and the coach was like, Weems, it's, it's all on you. I don't think that's too healthy for a 12-year-old, by the way. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? Like, like Weems, it's all on you. It's like, you're all we've got. This is it. I'll never forget, I walked up to the plate, man, and I was just so, I didn't want to let the team down. I didn't want to let anybody down. And my dad was watching. And I asked the and I even think he threw a pitch and I just watched it and it was a strike and I just asked the umpire for a second and I walked over to the fence and my dad was at the fence and I'll never forget I put my hands on the cage and my dad came down and I was crying I was just so I was just crying I didn't want to disappoint people I didn't think I could do it I was crying I didn't want anybody to see and I said dad I don't think I can do this and I'll never forget I looked in my dad's face And he said, Stovall, you can do this. He said, you're my son. 
and I love you. And it was just like looking into his face. I just, I got this courage. And I was about to walk off and he said, and Stovall, one more thing, swing as hard as you can. And I'll never forget, I walked up to that plate and all they, they, I don't even remember, they threw the, I, no, I didn't care where the ball was, I was gonna swing as hard as I could. <laughs> and he pitched that and I swung as hard as I could and all I, it was like a dream. I remember it like it was yesterday. It was like one of these defining moments in my life. And all I can remember is like coming to and hearing, Weems, <laughs> Weems, run, run, run. I, I'd, I'd hit the ball so far and everybody, and I was standing there like in shock. <laughs> and they were all screaming, run, Weems, run. I took off around the bases. It was a grand slam home run. And we won the game. Listen, you might be going back to some things thinking, how can I do this? I'm telling you, you can do it with the church. And if you look in your heavenly Father's eyes, you know what you'll hear him say? You can do it. You're my son. You're my daughter. I love you. And by the way, swing as hard as you can. Church, in this next year, we've got to swing as hard as we can. We are the church. We are the church. Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We're going to bring the relevance in with the revival. We're going to have a revolutionary move of God. And you know who's going to do it? We are. We are. you just to look into your heavenly father's eyes where is where is children where the church there's no plan B this is it are we just gonna stand there at the plate and let the balls go by are we going to swing as hard as we possibly can and be that exceedingly great army, the revolutionary church that we've all dreamed of, I believe is here and now and coming in this day, and we can be part of it. Just look into your heavenly Father's eyes right now. You'll hear him say, you can do it. I love you. Swing as hard as you can this year for my glory. Arise and shine for the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. The face of God looks at you to bless you and bring you peace.